Hello, this is Kevin Smith, the pastor of Sanders Chapel United Methodist Church, Cooley United Methodist Church, and First United Methodist Church of Winfield, Louisiana. Today I'm going to bring you the fifth of our sessions over the book of Micah. I'm seri a series I'm calling Good News for Troubled Times, and I'm going to link in YouTube the playlist so that you can go back and watch some of the previous ones if you've missed them along the way. So today we come to chapter 4 in the book of Micah, so I want to give you just a moment to open your Bible or maybe pull out your tablet and find it on Version or Orimus or whichever you prefer. Um, I would want to encourage you to find a translation, something like New Revised Standard, New International Version, New American Standard Bible, something of that nature that will be pretty close to the original text. And so today, as we get into chapter 4, there are a couple of things that I want you to be aware of as we start. First, I want you to remember how chapter 3 ended. It reads this way. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. And so the end of chapter 3 ends with this dire pronouncement of judgment that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And one of the things that we've talked about throughout the book of Micah is this process of judgment followed by hope through in Micah and in most of the Old Testament prophets. And so since chapter 3 ends on such a dire note, then we wonder, well, what awaits us in chapter 4? And in our typical prophecy process, chapter 4 brings this amazing word of hope to the Israelites and to God's people. Now, I'm going to divide this chapter into two sections. The first is I'm calling the character of restored Zion, and the second is the birth process of that restored Zion. Now, there are other scholars and theologians that divide it differently. I looked at Bob Utley. He divides it into three different sections. My Hebrew professor that we did this class with in Micah, he actually divides it into four different sections. So there are different ways to divide it up depending on how you interpret the scripture. I'm going to choose to divide it into two, that there are two sections in my Bible, and so that's how I'm going to do it today. So, we're going to start with verses 1 through 3 and, and about what the new Zion is going to look like. Now, this is quite a reversal, as we've talked about, from, from chapter 3. That In chapter 3, it ends with this dire pronouncement of judgment, and yet here in chapter 4, verse 1 looks forward to a future day when the a future kingdom when Mount Zion the, the, would be the center of the Messiah's earthly kingdom shall be raised both physically and spiritually. <clears throat> now whenever you see this phrase in the last days, it's talking about some future event, right? A lot of people think that it's talking about the end times depending on how you interpret it. And this phrase is the final period of, of history as far as the speaker's perspective. It's often looking forward to an ideal future or even a messianic future. So, so these days are talking about the coming of the Lord to the earth. A time when Jesus will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. He will set up his kingdom upon this earth and he will reign from Jerusalem. And if you know anything about history, then it seems that we have not seen those times yet. So these words in Micah spoken so long ago still have meaning for us as we look forward to the day when Jesus comes again and fully fulfills all of these scriptures, including this one in Micah. And it talks about how all nations will come to Jerusalem to worship with their king, and the temple will be reestablished as the house of the Lord, and it will be a time of perfect peace. Five years ago today, I was in Jerusalem, and one of the things when you go to Jerusalem is you see many of these Jerusalem crosses. It is a cross in the center with four crosses on each side. Now, there are several different interpretations of what the Jerusalem cross means, 
but one of them is that Jerusalem is the center of the world and people from all directions, north, south, east, and west, come to Jerusalem. And that, that kind of is reflected here in Micah chapter 4. And even when I was there in Jerusalem, I went to the garden tomb and there was a group of Oriental folks, I believe they were Korean, that they were praying and reading the scripture over here. And then there's a group of us that were speaking English. And then there was a group of folks, I believe from South America, that were speaking Spanish. And so, so, so still part of this has come true that people from all over the world come to Jerusalem today as a holy place. And so it still is a place where people go. But Micah looks forward to a day when there will be people from all over the world going there a place of perfect peace. In fact, Micah says that the Lord's house shall be exalted above the hills. Now, in chapter 3, it just says it's going to be destroyed, plowed as a field. But Micah says it's going to be rebuilt and it's going to be so grand that it's going to be above the, head, the hills. And, and that God is coming again and he's going to establish his kingdom in a mighty and wonderful way and it will become the most important mountain on earth. Now, one of the interesting things about this passage to begin with in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, is if, that if you look at Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 and 3, they are very similar, almost the same thing. So were the prophets borrowing from one another? Who was first? We don't know. They were approximately the same time, so it is possible that maybe the Lord gave them both a, the same message to speak and to record as part of their book. But it is interesting that both of these books have basically the same prophecy. And one of the things we talk about in Bible study, if you see it repeated, then that should be a signal to us to pay attention. And so here we see it repeated in Micah and also in Isaiah. And so it should be something for us to pay attention to that, that one day this is going to happen, that Jerusalem is going to become the, the holy place, a high holy place, and the people from all over will come there and that the Messiah will reign over a kingdom of peace. We haven't seen that day yet, but we can believe that that day is coming as we see it both in Micah and in Isaiah. So we talked a little bit about the, the transformation, right? That Micah chapter 3 says it's going to be ruins and a heap and a forest. But here in Micah chapter 4, it's going to be rebuilt into something glorious. We will also see people that follow God's ways and we may walk in his paths. And we're going to see that some more in Micah coming up in the next few chapters. But the idea of walking in God's path, that there are three steps to following God. The first is knowing God and entering in a personal relationship with Him. The second is knowing God and learning about God, reading the Bible, drawing closer to Him. And the, uh, the last step is to walk in His ways, to live in God's will through the things that we do and say. And it looks forward to a day when there will be no more war when the swords will become plowshares and there will be no conflicts between nations and individuals and that the Messiah is the one who is going to be the judge. Micah says that nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. This is looking forward to the day when there is no need for war. There is no need for bloodshed. Micah chapter 4 verses 1 and 5 describes four freedoms. Freedom from ignorance that God will teach us his ways. Freedom from war, neither shall they learn war anymore. Freedom from want is what he says, everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. Freedom from fear that no one shall make them feel afraid. Now when in verse 4 where Micah says that everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, it means that every person has an opportunity. Every person has a vine to grow grapes and make wine. Every person has a, a fig tree to eat uh, from and, and to feed themselves and their families. 
And these are things that would be outside. So the idea is that not only will you have these things to make yourself healthy and your feed your family, but you are safe enough and secure enough to lay under them in an open air place and not worry about bandits or invaders or anything of that nature. And so Micah looks forward to this day where everyone is provided for, everybody has what they need, and everyone feels safe. But in order for that to happen is that the remnant has to be restored. And, and Micah makes clear in verses 6 and 8 that the, 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 the remnant is not just for the strong, but it is for the weak and the disadvantaged, that they will also know the promises of God. And God says that this is going to come true, that you can trust God's word. And so we look forward to this day when Micah's vision and prophecy is fulfilled. So that is, first of all, the description about what the restored Zion will look like. And then in the latter half of the chapter, beginning in verses 9, we look at the process, okay? And, and Micah says that this process is a difficult one, that he starts by comparing it to the, the labor of a woman. And part of the pain that would be there is there would be no king, there would be no counselor in their midst. And remember all the way back to chapter 1 that Micah's condemnation is for the rulers who who, who work against their people, who eat their people, who take advantage of their people. So we know that part of Micah's prophecy is against these rulers, and he says that part of the pain uh, that the people will experience is that there's going to be no king, no ruler, no counselor that they can look to. He even looks to the day when they will have to go to Babylon, and there they will be delivered. And we know that that's what happened, that in 722, Assyria came in and destroyed the ten tribes of Israel, the ten northern tribes. And then in 586 BC, Babylon came in and took captive the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin and took them away into captivity, and then they returned after that. And so Micah says that the nations have gathered against Jerusalem, that they look forward to their destruction, that they are, are waiting just for them to be destroyed. He talks about that the nations are assembled against her, saying, let her be profaned and let our eyes gaze upon Zion. So they are waiting for the fall of Jerusalem. They are waiting for her destruction. They are, the idea that, that Micah gives is they are going to even rejoice and to make light of what happens in Jerusalem. And they want to look upon the holy places, right? That, that the, the reason that holy places are holy is that they have limited access. But if it were something that everyone could see, then they would no longer be holy or set apart, that they would be common places. And so the enemies of Jerusalem, they're looking forward to the day when they can gaze upon the holy of holies and see it destroyed. And they are waiting for that to rejoice in, over it. But uh, Micah says that that is going to happen first before Israel is restored. But he does end on this hopeful note, right? He says, Arise and get up, you daughter of Zion. I will make your horn iron and your hoofs bronze. Now for us, that seems really strange kind of imagery. But if we think about it, the horn is the hard part, the strong part of a goat or a bull. And Micah says that not only is it going to be the hardness as of bone or as of skin, or, or but it's going to be of iron, that it's going to be that hard. And, and the, bron the hooves, instead of being as hard as they normally are, they're going to be bronze, that they're going to be that strong. So the ultimate fulfillment, Micah says, is when Israel becomes are this holy hill when the, the Messiah becomes a superpower among the nations, becomes fulfilled and everyone flows to, the, to God's hill and looks to the Messiah for help and hope and strength. And so Micah in chapter 4, he ends 
chapter 3 on this terrible note about the destruction of Jerusalem, but here in chapter 4, he looks forward to the rebuilding of the Mount of the Lord and, and to where all these nations flow to it, and it's the place where God's justice and mercy flows. But he says it's not going to be an easy process to get there, that there's going to be some labor pains along the way. So I hope that you've enjoyed looking at chapter 4 with me. I would like to invite you to like, to comment, to share this as you um, would, would like to with your friends and family. Also, I look forward to seeing you again as we look at chapter 5 next time. And so we'd invite you to come and to be a part of Join Us for that. Thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful day. We miss you. We love you. We're praying for you. And we will see you later. Have a good day.